Hey everybody, John Greenwald here, founder and creator of TheBlackVault.com. Now I'm sending out this quick blast to address a topic that is gaining traction all over social media. Now my fear is that this will probably wind up on a couple of mainstream media outlets that are thirsty for UFO related stories. Now I've been tweeted at or notified by or sent direct messages on Reddit, Facebook and Twitter. And when that generally happens, I know that the story is picking up some steam and if it's not entirely accurate, well, these types of videos, although I don't like to do them, contrary to popular belief, and I don't want to burst bubbles here, but it is not quite what you are hearing about. Now, the headline itself is about the Pentagon admitting to having UFO debris. Now, the big question mark is, did they? What happened? Well, if you haven't seen this headline, uh, it, that probably won't be surprising because, again, it hasn't wound up in the mainstream media, at least not yet, but has been making its rounds throughout multiple social media networks and forums. And at that time, I, I, I felt that it might be necessary to talk about this because this is something that is heavily talked about on this channel. Now, if you're not familiar with what I'm talking about, this is an article, a blog that it appeared uh, and, and this is kind of the root of this story. This is, if you have been seeing this story, this is what you're confronted with. Anthony Bregalia, and I apologize if I have that pronounced incorrectly, has this blog, has been writing for a long time from what I understand, and ran this headline uh, here in the last day or so, Pentagon admits it has UFO debris, releases test results. And man, that sounds really cool, right? So I'm sure you probably like the majority of us, me included, click on it and go, what the heck is this about? I haven't seen any Pentagon statements. Not that I am always made aware of them, but my point is if the Pentagon were to admit that they had UFO debris, my guess is I'd probably see it on a major media outlet uh, very, very quickly. So I started reading through this and realized not only is, well, the majority of it entirely inaccurate, the root of it is a FOIA request right up my alley. I love stuff like that. Yet it is wildly misinterpreted. And that then paves the way for this inaccurate headline. And now it is starting to gain traction. And I think that this kind of stuff needs to be addressed. Now, I do want to dissect a couple parts of the article. I'll read some segments to you, show you a couple things, and really kind of explain what all this means and what the reality is behind it. And I want to start with the image that's at the top of the page here. Looks cool. Very reminiscent of like a Roswell type memory metal. And I want, I want to first start off with talking about what this means to the actual story. And that is absolutely nothing. This image has been around for years. I found a, a article with it back from 2013. Uh, it's just been floating around a low resolution image. Uh, probably from a television show or something like that. And it's used to essentially entice you to click on the story. Now, I use stock photos all the time. So that shouldn't be, you know, completely uh, uh, battered up. But I think that it is completely misleading when you run a headline like that. And you put this image right there going, wow, is, is this part of the UFO debris? What is that? Well, sadly, it means absolutely nothing to the story. Now, I want to start off by just reading the top part of this article for you. I'm not going to dissect the entire thing, but I do feel that part of this is important to break down a little bit. The article starts off like this. A stunning admission by the U.S. government that it possesses UFO debris was recently made in response to a Freedom of Information Act request filed over three years ago by this author. In a reply letter, the U.S. Defense Intelligence Agency, or DIA, has ended decades of speculation by verifying that UFO material has indeed been recovered. Now officially referred to as UAP, or Unidentified Aerial Phenomena, rather than UFOs, some this material, and again, that's an error in the article, I copy and pasted verbatim, this material was placed with a defense contractor for analysis and storage in specialized facilities. 
Incredibly, part of the information released discusses material with shape recovery properties, much like the memory metal debris found fallen at the Roswell UFO crash in 1947. Now there's Roswell again being pulled in here. The author, Anthony Bergalia, he does go into a little bit more detail of why he's connecting Roswell. I am not going to, like I said, pick apart every little uh, uh, tidbit on this article. I'm only going to focus on the Freedom of Information Act stuff and the material that's being wildly mis misrepresented. So I do urge you, if you want to go uh, read the article, it is linked down in the description on this YouTube video. Uh, but I, I'm just not a big fan of connecting Roswell to all of this, even though they are trying to connect this metal and so on and so forth. You will see as you watch this video, none of that is very accurate when it comes to captured debris and stuff that they've been analyzing from a UAP, but I'll get into that in a few moments. Now, obviously the specialized facilities that Anthony Bregalia is, is referring to is part of Bigelow Aerospace. This is the OSAP contract. Uh, this is something that I've talked quite a bit about on this very channel. This is what's connected to ATIP and the so-called Pentagon UFO study and the original New York Times article that came out in December of 2017, which talked about Bigelow Aerospace specially designing buildings to house debris or material of some kind, which we learned were uh, things called metamaterials. So that's obviously what he is referring to with that particular section. An another part of the article and here's a quote in their reply. The DIA amazingly agrees that it has documents responsive to my request on recovered UFO debris and its analysis. The program under which it was administered a tip, the advanced aerospace threat identification program, and that their defense contractor Bigelow aerospace in Las Vegas, Nevada has stored the material. They also provide some reports related to the possible applications of the studied material. Okay, so those were the parts I wanted to read to you because those are the most explosive claims in this, and that is what's really getting the most traction throughout social media and all of the different channels uh, that, that you may or, or potentially may not be involved in. But if you're in any of these groups, it's definitely making its rounds. So let's dissect this a little bit. I already started with that header image. Uh, and, and yes, I, I kind of made a joke out of it because it is. I, I really do st think stuff like that is very, very misleading. But that being said, let's dissect a little bit. Anthony Bregalia, he, he put his original FOIA request on the article so you can download it. I commend that. That's, uh, that's something that I like to do. That way you can see either how I request it or more so how the government responds. I'm not going to read uh, every little word here, but this FOIA request specifically asked for uh, an inventory list and all associated documentation of said material. Such documentation will include physical description of all held material, source of origin of all held material, circumstance and method of obtainment of all held material, custodian U.S. government agency of all held material, the titles and authors of all technical and analytical reports conducted on all held material, names of private contractors to the U.S. government engaged in the storage and study of all held material, Test results on UAP recovered material to include physical properties, chemical and elemental composition of material, and determination of the material as of terrestrial or extraterrestrial origin. Can't knock the FOIA request. It's seeking some pretty interesting stuff. All of that specific came after setting up, uh, again, Anthony Bregalia in this uh, FOIA request, setting up ATIP, setting up Harry Reid and Elizondo, setting up uh, potentially these uh, metal-like alloy material recovered from UAPs. So he set all that up and was specifically asking about ATIP-related material. Now, there is a part of this that's key, and that, that's number five. So put a pin in that because I'm going to come back to it. Here is the actual response from the DIA. And I want to read to you this part of it uh, because this is where I, I'm guessing the root of all this confusion is. Here's the DIA's letter. This response to your Freedom of Information Act request dated December 27, 2017 that you submitted to the DIA for information concerning requesting all information on test results from the UAP material from Bigelow Aerospace. I'll get back to why that sounds weird. 
I apologize for the delay in responding to your request. DIA continues its efforts to eliminate large backlog of pending FOIA requests. A search of DIA systems of records located five documents, 154 pages, responsive to your request. And they were released with partial redactions. And the FOIA letter goes into two of the redaction, uh, or excuse me, the citations, I should say, and the exemptions B3 and B6, which were used to withhold some of the information. They were all unclassified or for official use only. These are what we know as the DIRD reports. Uh, or the defense and uh, information reference documents. So the DIRDs, uh, they uh, total a number of 38 that we have found out through the FOIA, some of which have leaked out. This is one of the first releases in an official capacity. So that part of this FOIA request should be commended. I, I wish that that was the headline because that really is the most important part of this story. This is the first time officially that some of those DIRD reports were released, at least that I am aware of. So uh, kudos for that part of it. But sadly, that point was missed. Now, I want to go back to that paragraph that I was telling you about uh, where up here. Let me bring out my laser pointer here. Uh, the December 27, 2017, that you submitted to the DIA for information concerning requesting all information on test results from the UAP material from Bigelow Aerospace. The reason why I think that that sounds kind of odd is because it is. And I think that maybe that's the root of where this is because they think, meaning Anthony Brigalia in his article, thinks because they termed it that way, uh, that they are now saying this is UAP material from Bigelow Aerospace. That to me is not true. After filing 10,000 requests, you kind of learn that they have these boilerplate responses and generally will copy and paste dates, FOIA case numbers, and the description of the requests. Consider those variables. And so you've got your boilerplate letter and they copy and paste uh, those types of things that are really the only thing that changes throughout their different FOIA responses. Uh, I've received actually just a few weeks ago here in 2021, received a FOIA request that was erroneously dated 2020. Uh, and it was because they were using the template. Moments later, I got a, a, a resubmission of that FOIA response. The only difference was the date. So a lot of times they use these boilerplate templates and mess up. Uh, so this, I believe, was a copy and paste. So for information concerning, then they paste in what it was, requesting all information. That's probably from an internal log. So I dug out the FOIA case log. It's not a match, but it shows you how they uh, kind of summarize things internally. This is the FOIA case log uh, for those 2018 cases. This is the FOIA case number for Brigalia's request. And this is how they summarized it requesting all information on the a tip we know that that's not accurate in their internal log my whole point here is that's just how they summarize things so it was probably a copy and paste that was not an admission that they were releasing uap debris test analyses in the form of these records i know that that's dry but it is important to um po to, to point out because uh, again that's that's how they operate internally Going back to the fact that it was interesting that these DIRD reports came out for the first time because it, it showed me, because I'm a geek who cares about this stuff, what do they feel they can't release? What can they feel that they uh, have to redact and cite under a FOIA exemption? Now, I'm only showing this because it's widely distributed. I don't, liked, I don't like leaked documents. Many of you know that if you are a fan of this channel. I don't necessarily support it. I do believe that there are national security and privacy concerns that need to be maintained. However, this is so widely distributed. There's nothing really sensitive on it. Uh, and uh, this is the interesting part of this. Part of what they redacted is kind of public knowledge anyway. So you can see here the bottom is the leaked version. That is uh, one of the reports that uh, George Knapp had leaked out. The top is the FOIA request uh, release. This is the official declassification or release, I should say, because it was unclassified of a very similar document. They're both DIRD reports. You can see here that Defense Warning Office is exempted under B3. 
Now, this is a, um, a sem- uh, an exemption that's cited where something is exempt by a statute, an internal statute. What I'm surprised, though, is the DWO or Defense Warning Office has been known for years. So I'm, I'm a little surprised to see that. I'll, dr- I'll drive home that point in a moment. Uh, but down here, uh, C-L-A-R-D-W-O-3, uh, that's just going to be the Defense Warning Office, uh, you know, one of their either routing codes or a particular person, or I'm, I'm not really sure. I mean, it, it's kind of hard to tell exactly what this would be, but obviously it's sending an attention to someone or some, you know, desk uh, at the Defense Warning Office. And then this name here, James Lukatsky, who's believed to be uh, the head of the OSAP program, as it states here in this leaked version. And he was the one that essentially dropped off when it got transferred over to OSD, which is where Luis Elizondo uh, is said to have taken over. Back to the Defense Warning Office, why they thought that they needed to exempt that, I have no idea. Here's a tweet by the Defense Intelligence Agency talking about the Defense Warning Office. So uh, this is back in 2019 when they tweeted this out. My whole point is, is it's kind of weird sometimes when you see these redactions because there's no rhyme or reason sometimes. If the DWO was something that was maybe rumored about, let's say like, mm, I don't know, the NSA PRISM program or something Edward Snowden released, uh, Echelon is another prime example of these spying rumored programs, uh, then I can understand why essentially that would be exempted uh, generally under exemption B1. But regardless, my point remains is that it would it would be exempted. But once it's released before, it's not a bad thing to say it. So I'm... I'm, I'm Intrigued by it. Uh, so we'll, we'll find out as, as time goes on why they might have done that. But I wanted to show you just kind of the oddity of, of them doing that. These were the five DIRD reports that re- were released under this FOIA request. Metallic glasses, status and prospects for aerospace applications. That was the first one. Biomaterials, the second. Materials for advanced aerospace, aerospace platforms, the third. Metallic spintronics, the fourth. And the fifth, meta materials for aerospace applications. Sounds really cool. They're highly technical. We know by the leaked versions, they are just highly technical programs. You'll see here too, backing up what I told you, they are all unclassified for official official use only. That means that they don't have a classification. They're not secret. They're not confidential. They're not top secret. They are unclassified. But the for official use only means that they cannot be distributed without a review, hence a FOIA review or a mandatory declassification review, or some kind of executive order that mandates their de- uh, release to the public, whatever it may be, uh, you just can't release them. So that's F-O-U-O or for official use only. What is not in the documents, nothing about aliens, nothing about unidentified flying objects or UFOs, nothing about unidentified aerial phenomena or UAPs, nothing about debris of the unknown kind, that is, nothing about crashes, nothing about materials stored in a warehouse, let's say at a place like Bigelow Aerospace, etc. That's pretty weird given the headline that we've been dissecting here and all of the information that this is allegedly UFO or UAP material of extraterrestrial origin stored at a warehouse. Yet all of these documents have absolutely nothing to do with it. I did found, find one reference to extraterrestrial. And this one, the metallic glasses status of prospects for aerospace applications. I'll read that line to you. Such, such structural foams could be useful in applications requiring strength and stiffness under compressive loads, such as structural panels for extraterrestrial buildings. Conceivably, such structural form, foams, foams, excuse me, I keep getting tongue tied, might have been produced on site from raw feedstock, reducing the volume of material that needs to be launched. Well, that's not the extraterrestrial we were looking for. The extraterrestrials are humans building uh, essentially buildings or something on another planet, hence an extraterrestrial building using the feedstock or the available material uh, on that particular planet as we expand. Now, why would that be in there? Well, it's important to know what OSAP was actually all about. Because, again, we're being led to believe that this was all about aliens and and crashed UFOs. And trust me, there's a lot to the UFO phenomena that goes way beyond a terrestrial explanation uh, in my viewpoint, meaning it's not as easily explainable as drones and balloons. However, 
a lot of people are just kind of on that 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 page that they're saying that this program, OSAP or ATIP, however they want to refer to it, uh, was all about UFOs and, and this crash debris. And this headline is a perfect example of trying to tie all that in, take these documents and say, aha, this is proof that the government is actually admitting to UFO debris being captured. And so what we have to do is dissect what OSAP was all about. Now, this is the public bid solicitation. This is on the Wayback Machine. And the reason why I have to link to that uh, is simply because this fedbizops.gov site has been changed and, 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 um, and, and altered over the years, so the URLs aren't the same. But this stayed online for years. There's no mention of UFOs, UAPs, unidentified anything. Uh, what this was, and I'll read to you because this is incredibly important on what OSAP was. Keep in mind, we're being led to believe it's a UFO research program, but let me read to you what the bid that went out was. This is from the document. The Acquisition Support Division, DWO3, that's the Defense Warning Office of the Defense Intelligence Agency, has the responsibility to provide guidance and oversight to the DOD. Acquisition process, along with leveraging the DOD intelligence community to coordinate, produce, and maintain projections of the future threat environment in which U.S. air, naval, ground, space, missile defense, and information systems operate. In order to accurately assess the foreign threat to U.S. weapon systems, a complete and possible understanding of potential breakthrough technology applications employed in future aerospace weapon systems must be obtained. So this is the root of why uh, uh, the DIA wanted OSAP created. Here's the objective that they listed in the open bid solicitation. So again, anybody who was cleared uh, when it comes to a contractor basis could bid on this. The objective, one aspect of the future threat environment involves advanced aerospace weapon system applications. The objective of this program is to understand the physics and engineering of these applications as they apply to the foreign threat out to the far term, i.e. from now through the year 2050. Primary focus is on breakthrough technologies and applications that create discontinuities in currently evolving technology trends. The focus is not in extrapolations of current aerospace technology. The proposal, shall, the proposal shall describe a technical approach which discusses how the breakthrough technologies and applications listed below would be studied and include proposed key personnel that have experience in those areas. Here were the requirements. The contractor shall complete advanced aerospace weapon system technical studies in the following areas. Lift, propulsion, control, power generation, spatial temporal translation, materials, configuration structure, signature reduction, human interface, human effects, armament, other peripheral areas and support. So the whole point of me reading that to you is what they were doing was analyzing potential advances in material, propulsion systems, etc., cetera, et cetera. Those are the dirds that you just saw that were released in this FOIA request. Albeit interesting, that's the headline. Sadly, it got turned into, this is proof of UFO debris. Now, if you recall, I went back to, uh, I told you to put a pin in number five of their FOIA request, Anthony Bregalia's original FOIA request. And that was the number that said uh, that they were looking for the authors and the titles of the technical reports. Now, I'm here to tell you that most FOIA officers, again, contrary to popular belief, are actually there to help. Now, after 24 plus years of doing this, I will confidently say that most of them, not all of them, uh, there's some really bad exceptions to the rule, but most of them are wanting to help and they don't like the stereotype of just hiding everything from the general public. Uh, they don't like that. And so a lot of times you'll find that FOIA officers will try if they can to go above and beyond and get you what you're looking for. They'll make a phone call. They'll ask you, what exactly are you looking for? Or they'll say, Hey, the way you termed your request is so voluminous. There's 3 million pages that came up. So what is it exactly that you're looking at? All of those I have received phone calls before in the past. So they want to help. Now, back to that original FOIA request, there was one line that did talk about the authors and the reports. That is what dinged, I believe, 
internally the responsive records, the five records, the 140 plus pages, whatever it is. All of the other items on the list that talked about extraterrestrial debris or rumored this or rumored that, that doesn't mean that that's confirmation at all. It just means that that one item out of that whole list came up with these five reports, all dealing with the material when it came to the OSAP program and the technical reports that they created. Now, that was misconstrued to go, aha, this is an admission that the UFO debris that was captured by the U.S. government is sitting in some warehouse, and here are the technical analyses of said debris. None of that could be farther from the truth. If you look at those documents, they are to the T fulfilling what you see on your screen here, completing advanced aerospace weapon system technical studies on materials. Number six on this list. That is what they were contracted to do. And so to kind of connect all these uh, rumors about what OSAP was, and I know some people hate me for not jumping on the bandwagon saying, yeah, they were uh, investigating ghosts, poltergeists, cryptozoology, and UFOs. Yes, that is the going theory out there, or the going claim, I should say, when it comes to OSAP. And then that morphed into ATIP, which, which was the UFO only. I'm sorry, I don't see that. And when you try and take those rumors and then put them into what could have been a very cool story and blow it way out of proportion and go, aha, this is connected to potentially the Roswell material and it's all extraterrestrial. Um, I just have an issue with that because you are taking that cool story and blowing it out of proportion. And this is that snowball effect. I hope I'm wrong that mainstream media is is uh, is going to probably jump on on this, at least in part. But they might you, you might see some of those tabloids overseas pick it up and then that sometimes ends up on drudge and i always scratch my head going does anybody read what they're putting out there anymore but regardless all of that is a complete and utter stretch it's not even a difference of opinion it, they're just not connected one of the last lines uh, in the article by the author what has been learned through this FOIA investigation is indeed historic there are ufo materials that have been recovered this is where we are misleading the public with articles like this and spotlighting articles like this. I don't like calling people out. Uh, it's not what I have a lot of fun doing, but I'm not afraid to do it when I feel that it's deserved. And on, on this one, I feel that it is absolutely uh, deserved. One of the other things I want to address, I actually made a presentation about this and, and didn't have time just with my work schedule uh, to do the video. I may still do it. I'm not sure. And I had stumbled on it, but I want to pull in a, a few points that I feel are pertinent to this particular video. Robert Bigelow just did a, uh, a sit down interview and on video with George Knapp. Kudos to George Knapp because Robert Bigelow has pretty much been non-existent when it comes to commenting on OSAP or ATIP related subject matter. So for him to address it, even in short, uh, very much want to commend George Knapp for doing that. There were a lot of nuggets that came out, some of which some people won't like me to bring up maybe at a later date, but it was very telling on some of the answers. And that's not me twisting words. That's just what uh, Mr. Bigelow had come out with. But regardless, I feel a couple quotes I want to throw in here because I want to kind of button this OSAP story and my whole point with this. Here's one of the quotes. We had a lot of ducks in a row and we had bought facilities, spent uh, millions of dollars in buying buildings. And I did have a large program to do a major construction on this property besides what we already have here. And that was going to be re really fun and cool. Again, this is Robert Bigelow. This is a rough transcript too. Uh, so it's a little bit choppy. In fact, what I was going to use, so we would have nothing that would protrude the surface much. I was going to use life support systems that you use in space because you don't have a door you can go out of or a window you can put up right so you survive based on the ecosystem, the environment control support systems that you create on board your stations. So what he was saying was what he was planning to do, not necessarily what he had done. Now that's all cool. I, I, I agree with Mr. Bigelow here. That is very cool. 
But what was really sticking out to me was he had not done it yet. Some of the buildings, yeah, he says that he spent million, many millions of dollars. Was that OSAP money? I'm not sure yet. He's implying that it was. Uh, so, so I find that interesting. But then he had plans for something even more, even bigger. And I think that that's key to understanding what really went down on OSAP. Here's an exchange between George Knapp and Robert Bigelow. And to me, this was a, this was a kicker moment on colliding reality with the rumors that have surfaced and the rumors that have gone around or the implications that have gone around. George Knapp asks, I know that you did knock on many doors during the OSAP during the Bass program, and that doors got slammed as you're asking for sensitive, sensitive stuff, access to sensitive stuff. Bigelow chimes in in the middle of that, and he says, yeah. George Knapp, is the secrecy directly related to what you're just talking about, the military, the military imperative? We're going to hold on to this stuff and figure out how to make weapons out of it, and we got to get there before the Russians and Chinese do because they are working on it, right? Bigelow, yeah. Then he goes on to crashes. Some of you may find that part interesting. To me, I'm not going to go through all of it. Uh, it it kind of it lacks evidence, to be blatantly honest with you. But he does refer to crashes in different countries and so on and so forth. But we have no idea the provenance of any of that information. So go listen to the interview. I'll link it below. But again, it, it's um, uh, it's interesting probably to, to some of you, but not not relevant to this. What is relevant, though, is the fact that he was he was aiming to get access to sensitive stuff like George Knapp had asked him and the doors were slammed shut. He did not disagree with that at all. If any of the rumors were true, that truly alien technology was given to a private contractor. I, I have I have problems with that. Uh, but let's get beyond that. Let's just say I'm completely wrong and that the U.S. government or the U.S. military alike would give extraterrestrial technology to a private contractor, especially one who is not afraid to go on major primetime television shows and say aliens are walking among us. If that is true, and they gave Robert Bigelow extraterrestrial technology to house in buildings that are worth millions, why would they deny him access to anything? Because in my mind, the proof, the irrefutable proof of alien technology would be one of the most highly classified topics or objects, I should say, in our military and government holdings. There's just no way around that. It would be highly classified. So if you're going to give that to a private contractor and they go, okay, look, in order to weaponize this, in order to make it better, in order to learn from it, in order to build American tech to lead us to the 22nd century uh, to where we are number one and nobody's ever close to us. We need X, Y, and Z. You better believe the U.S. government and military would give them access to anything and everything that they needed to do just that. Why? Because they hold the secret not only to the U.S. military and to the government, the biggest secret that they hold. They hold the, the biggest secret of the cosmos. Why would you deny them access then to essentially take the next step to understand that? to make it better, to weaponize it, to do whatever they were aiming to do. Why would you deny that entity that you gave extraterrestrial technology to? Why would you deny them to other sensitive programs? What the heck is more sensitive than alien tech? I just don't buy it. That to me, this part of the interview was essentially the kicker on these rumors and the implications and the unfounded claims that alien material is housed in a warehouse in the middle of Las Vegas at Bigelow Aerospace. And yet he is willing to say, yeah, I was denied all this access. I couldn't get anything. I do not believe those things go hand in hand. And that's why I wanted to bring up this part of the interview. There were some other nuggets and I may make that other video uh, time permitting, but for now I wanted to dissect the FOIA response, the FOIA documents, Commend the fact that those dirt reports came out officially. I wish that was the story, but I do think we have to put it into proper context because I've, as I've said on this channel countless times, context is absolutely key. Thank you all for listening. If you like this channel, like this video, I know it's a little long winded. I didn't mean to do it that way but I wanted to give you guys the most accurate information as I could. If you like all of it, you know what to do. 
smash that subscribe button, press the thumbs up and turn the notifications on. It's a great help to me. And it shows me that you guys actually care what I have to say. Sorry for the long windedness, but that is who I am. And that's what this channel is all about. Apparently is long windedness, but I hope you got something uh, useful out of it. This is John Greenwald Jr. Signing off. We'll see you next time.